Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Women in Identities webinar on the human impact of ID exclusion. I'm going to give people a few more uh, minutes or seconds to join us and then we will get started with the session today. Okay, um, hopefully everybody has been able to make their way in. Um, I will get started in that case. Okay, thank you everyone for, for joining us on, on the first of what will be a series of webinars talking about the research that Women in Identity is undertaking, which is developing a global identity code of conduct. Uh, the first of these webinars is all around the human impact of ID exclusion, which is the first piece of research that we have completed as part of the wider code of conduct project. Oh, let me just make sure I turn on closed captions so that uh, we have that available. Okay. So, uh, brief agenda for today. So, we'll start with some introductions. So, it'll be myself uh, and Jeremy Grant uh, talking through uh, through this phase of the work. Uh, we'll cover the uh, an overview of the whole of the Code of Conduct project, then we'll deep dive into the human impact piece specifically. So I'll give a little bit of a summary on the work that uh, we're trying to, or that we've recently published, uh, talking specifically around what we did and what we found. At that point, we'll then move into a bit of a discussion between myself and Jeremy in terms of reacting to the work that's been put out there and, and Jeremy sharing some of his insights into sort of uh, ID exclusion more broadly and, and how it's impacting the, the US market where he's based. I'll then touch on the next steps for the code of conduct research. So what we will be doing from this point onwards, I'll mention a little bit about how you can get involved and then we will have time at the end for Q&A. So today's speakers are myself, uh, Louise Vega-Latin, as I've already mentioned, and Jeremy Grant, who I will let introduce himself. Great, thank you. Well, good morning or good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are around the globe. Uh, I'm Jeremy Grant, I'm based out of Washington, DC. Uh, as the slide says, I'm the Managing Director of Technology Business Strategy at Venable. We're a law firm based out of DC that focuses on identity and cybersecurity and privacy, uh, though I'm not an attorney. There's a longer discussion there for another time. Uh, but have been working more than 25 years in and around the digital identity space, including several years uh, leading the White House initiative here in the US, the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, uh, helped build out and manage the digital identity team at NIST as part of that. Uh, and now as a consultant, uh, I'm quite active in and around a bunch of different issues around technical standards and policy issues in identity, including leading an organization called the Better Identity Coalition, which has started to focus quite a bit on issues around uh, inclusion and equity and identity systems and what governments uh, need to be doing uh, to try and address issues there and you know make sure that these systems can work for, for everybody. So really excited I could be uh, included today. Thank you. Amazing, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, and I know uh, lots of you were expecting this to be a panel of three people. So we were supposed to have Fuchsia Carter with us as well, who was one of the participants in this phase of the research and focuses on inclusion um, within, or, recruitment and inclusion within HSBC. Unfortunately, she is unable to join us today. She had a bit of an accident and has, has injured her wrist uh, whilst on holiday in Italy. So she unfortunately can't join us today, but I'm hopeful that we will be able to get Fuchsia onto a later session where we can dig into some of the insights that she has to share on kind of why she got involved with the project um, and how she sees uh, the work impacting the areas that she focuses on. Um, and what the next steps are from her perspective. So well wishes out to Fuchsia and hopefully we will be able to get her onto a one-to-one -one session where she can share some of her insights on this topic. 
So before uh, we delve into the meat of the discussion, just some quick housekeeping points. So obviously, as you'll all know, this session is being recorded so that we can share it with everybody who hasn't been able to make the session. It will go on to the uh, Women in Identity YouTube channel in the subsequent days. Um, so everybody can access that just in case they miss anything from today. In terms of questions, so we will save some time at the end of this session to make sure we have a Q&A. So if anybody on the call wants to ask anything, make any comments, if you're able to, please share those within the chat function. Uh, I'll be keeping an eye on that and I'll come to that at, right at the end of the session. If you're unable to use the chat function, then please click the raise your hand icon um, and then we will come to you during the uh, Q&A session at the end and you can pose your question directly to myself and to Jeremy. Um, I think everybody is muted as a sort of a standard, so hopefully we won't get too many interruptions from background noise. I mean, hopefully no one will come barging into the room that I'm in and cause any, any issues, but if that does happen, I'll try and get myself on mute as quickly as possible. Uh, so yeah, if you can, uh, if you do have questions, like I said, either raise your hand and we will come to you during the Q&A, or throughout the conversation as Jeremy and I are talking, please add those questions to the chat and we will come to them at the end of our piece. So <clears throat> the code of conduct overview. So I think, you know, we've been sharing quite a bit uh, over the past couple of years about our desire to do this research, to focus on building an ID code of conduct because we think it's really necessary in the industry. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is ensure that people or organizations who are creating digital identity solutions are taking into account all of the potential users of those solutions and not Tr oh, trying not to bake any further bias or exclusion into any of those systems. So as those systems become sort of increasingly the gatekeepers for like consumers and for citizens to access different services, I think we in Women in Identity and, and much further beyond have become acutely aware that any sort of biases or exclusionary practices that existed previously are only gonna be further enhanced through the switch into digital identity. So we want to create a code of conduct that means that everybody uh, producing solutions in this space knows the steps that they need to go through in order to develop an overall solution that is as inclusive as it possibly can be and that works for all of the people that it should be working for and doesn't further exclude any particular sort of citizens or customer segments. So the research that we've undertaken is split into these phases that you can see on the screen. Today, we're gonna to focus on the human impact of ID exclusion, but just to quickly cover off the other phases, which are the economic impact, uh, which is understanding kind of what it means from a financial perspective to uh, have exclusionary practices built into digital identity. So what does that mean for a business and a business's bottom line? And also what does that mean from an end user perspective as well, from an economic standpoint? The phase that we're moving into over the course of the rest of this year will be the code of conduct development itself. So how do we come up with a set of guiding principles that will ensure that all digital identity systems have a, a consistent and high quality user experience for all users rather than just for some users. And then the last phase will be the implementation framework. So how do we go about taking these guiding principles that we plan to develop and ensuring that organizations are actually adhering to them and conforming to them. So there's still some questions around what that certification will look like and that's what we plan to work through over the coming um, phases of this work. But today's focus is on the human impact of, of ID exclusion and I thought it was really important to start with this as an area because so often the identity industry focuses on the technology and what the technology can do and that is a really really important sort of set of points to be thinking about but I think identity is ultimately a human issue and I think if we don't put humans at the center of the story we're kind of losing a huge amount from really developing useful solutions for people. So the first phase of our work has been focused on human impact and today we're going to dig into that in a little bit more detail. So before I continue to talk further I wanted to share one of the video outputs from the work that we've done which summarizes sort of the issue that is human the human impact of ID exclusion focusing particularly on the UK market. So please everybody let me know if you can see and hear this video. So 
I don't have any birth certificates or driving license or anything to, the only thing I have is utility bill and that's not going to get me anyway. So that's what I rely on mostly. If you don't have the financial means to get what you need, then you just can't get it, can you? So it's, I try not to think of it. If I did, I'd go crazy. That's the base, to be honest with you. You just don't accept your lot really, own you? And just work around it as much as you can. Entonces, eh, me sentí en todo modo como muy asustada con respecto a esto y excluida, es porque déjame trabajar, ¿sabes? Eh, hazlo un poco más difícil, solo quiero trabajar. Y entonces, corrí el riesgo, fui y, bueno, dijo una buena persona y pude abrir la cuenta bancaria, pero obviamente tuve que mentir, tuve que mentir. Eh, pero lo que sé es que mucha gente lo pasa mal y, y no pueden empezar a, a trabajar porque no, no tienen ese contrato. Y los bancos lo hacen muy difícil, no sé por qué. जो इले जो सब यूटिलिटीज मिल वगैरह होता है वो उसमें जो मेरे रिलेटिव्स होते हैं उनका नाम आता है हम दोनों का हम दोनों में से किसी का भी नहीं आता तो इसीलिए हमको थोड़े ज्यादा टाइम लग गया एड्रेस प्रूफ के लिए जस्ट ऐसा लग रहा है कि कि यहां पे ऐसे जस्ट प्रूफ ऑफ एड्रेस मिलने में हमको इतना इतनी डिफिकल्टीज फेस करनी पड़ती है तो सब आगे जाके क्या होगा In Lewis, where I used to live, there was a bank that I couldn't get into because it was up three stairs. And there was just a little bell to push. And the banking vault would have to come out, take all my identification, take my bank cards, take my money, go back in, do my banking for me, and leave me there with all my belongings gone. And I found that so uncomfortable to the extent that I would actually drive to another town to go and do my banking because I did not want those things leaving my side. And, and that's exclusion to such a basic level. Okay. So hopefully that gives everyone a taster of the sort of, ooh, it twice, uh, of some of the, the, the work that we did. And after this session, I will make sure that I share the links to all of the other uh, YouTube videos that we created as part of this work. So to summarize um, where we focused as part of this phase of the research, we looked at the financial services use case. So ID exclusion is, you know, it's a massive topic and a massive issue. And we thought if we're gonna do something useful and meaningful, we need to start with a specific use case. And so we chose that to be the financial services use case and getting people access to the relevant financial services that they need. So the questions we asked were around four different areas. And the first of which was, you know, who are the key demographics that are currently excluded uh, in digital identification, particularly as it pertains to financial services. Um, and we also raised the question of whether or not that was different across mature and emerging markets. So the two areas that we focused on for this phase of work were the UK representing a mature market and Ghana representing an emerging market. The second question we wanted to ask was, you know, what form does exclusion usually take? Um, and from a user perspective, so individuals who are actually experiencing exclusion, you know, what do they recommend in terms of improving the situation for themselves and for others who face exclusion? The third point was around, you know, what measures are product designers and policy makers taking currently to ensure inclusion is baked, baked into the digital identity systems that are being created? And how can those initiatives, if they exist, how can they be strengthened? And how are they seeing people buying into that from a sort of an ID systems perspective. And then the final question was, you know, what might an identity code of conduct for inclusion and diversity within financial services actually look like? So if we, you know, if we had a magic wand that we could wave, what are the changes that we think we would need to make in order for an ID code of conduct to actually uh, yield some, some useful results? Wanted to point out also that you know we didn't do this work by ourselves. We had some really great collaborators um, on this particular phase of the work. So we worked with Caribou, who Caribou Digital rather, who you know helped us with the, the writing of the reports and the carrying out of the interviews um, and Habitus Insights. So the video that you just saw and the other videos that are available on our YouTube channel, they did all of that um, the videography work for us and all of the editing and putting together those really interesting and insightful stories. 
So what did we actually do? Uh, the, the work was split into two phases, uh, first of which was the end user interviews. So we spoke with 20 different individuals whose lives are impacted by ID exclusion, again, particularly with the focus on financial services um, across the UK and Ghana. So 10 individuals in the UK, 10 individuals in Ghana, because um, we wanted to understand what that means for their day-to-day -day lives, how that impacts them on a day-to-day -day basis, and also to draw a bit of a comparison between you know, what things are specific to the countries in which they're residing and which things are common across you know, whether or not they're in an emerging market or a mature market. Um, so that was the, the bulk of the work was focused on those end user interviews so we could get first-hand insight into what it actually means to be excluded. And the second part of the work that we did was the expert interviews. So again, across both of those markets, we spoke to identity experts, five in each of the geographies, to understand where digital identity is within the respective markets and what approaches are actually being taken uh, with regards to driving greater inclusion. We were also able, because we did the end user interviews first, to take some of the challenges raised by the end users and actually pose them to the experts to see how they are either dealing with those sorts of challenges in the solutions that exist today or how they plan to factor in those challenges in the solutions that will exist in the future. So sort of five key principles emerge from just this phase of the work which will be foundational in creating the ID code of conduct which is where we'll be going to next and I just briefly want to touch on those five key principles and again if anyone has any thoughts or questions on this I'd encourage you to put those thoughts in the chat or you know uh, save up and uh, raise your hand when we get to the Q&A section at the end. So the five principles that uh, we are currently uh, thinking around are the first being that the user is at the center of the ID ecosystem and I think I mentioned this in my introduction that so oftentimes we think about digital identity as a technical solution or a technical problem to be solved and oftentimes that doesn't put the user at the very center of, of all of the thinking that we're doing and all of the designing and building that we're doing. So I think the key thing from doing this piece of research first was making sure that we're putting the user at the center of all of this because ultimately the technology is an enabler and it's going to enable the user to get access to the services that they need. So we need to always be mindful that we're putting the user in the very center of everything that we're trying to do. A second point was around how social norms are changing and that we need to not only acknowledge but also accommodate for these in our new customer journeys that we're building. I think historically, certainly in the sort of ID verification space, it's, it's kind of been a one size fits all and everything else is a little bit of an edge case. But I think as digital identity sort of becomes more and more important, we can't really afford to be thinking of, well, this is the majority and these are the edge cases because this sort of technology needs to work for everybody equally. So every use case, regardless of how often or little it appears in society, needs to be equally catered for. And those new journeys are a reflection of the societal norms changing. And we as digital identity professionals and, and providers need to be reflective of that in our, in our technologies. The third point was around a move towards proportionality. So things like vouching and tiered KYC and electronic KYC, um, making sure that the, we leverage the technology and the data that we have so that we can reduce the burden of identity on the, user, on the end user. So one thing that was quite striking from all of the videos and all of the um, sort of interview notes that I read was that it's always, the burden of proof is always on the end user. And we have so much capability, so much technology, that means we could actually reduce that burden if we, if we tried to, if we wanted to. And I think that's the route that we need to be moving towards. So they're actually making it easier for people, as well as giving them alternative routes for verifying their own identity. We're, making, we're taking that burden away from the end user and using the technology and the data that we have access to, to do some more of the heavy lifting. The fourth point was around uh, identification being individual, but the fact that we live within a network of people that already know us. So how can we leverage those network effects, particularly when you think about things like delegated authorities or intermediaries? How can we use the information that we have that exists in the networks that you know, are already there to be able to verify somebody or someone who doesn't ne isn't necessarily able to verify themselves but has delegated authority, how are we taking that 
into account and how are we making it easier for people in those situations to be able to verify themselves. And then the last point, which is something that I touch on quite a lot in general, is the, build, the building of diverse identity solutions relies on the diversity of the teams often that build those solutions. So we as individuals, as humans, we all tend to solve for the problems that we have. And if we don't have a diverse set of people building the solutions in the first place, we're gonna solve for a very sort of narrow set of problems faced by those people that are in the room when the designing actually happens. So if we can bring people in that have a much broader set of experiences, then logic would state that we will be solving for a broader set of problems purely based on the fact that we have a broader set of experiences coming to the design table. And I think that carries on all the way through, not just at design, but also at test, also at launch, also continuously uh, reviewing and revising solutions to make sure that they are working for as many people as possible. So those are sort of the five key principles that you'll sort of see throughout all of the sessions that we do on the Code of Conduct Research, because that those will be the foundations that will create the wider guiding principles within the ID Code of Conduct. So I've spoken lots and you <laughs> heard me speak a lot. So now I'm going to uh, turn the floor over to a bit of a discussion with Jeremy. So um, first question, I suppose, Jeremy, I know you you probably got an early sight of this report before it went out to the to the wider world. Uh, was there anything in there that particularly surprised you when you went through all of the content that we that we shared? Um, you know, surprise is an interesting term. I'd say I was both surprised and not surprised, um, and also somewhat depressed. Uh, you know, sometimes we, we sit here in the US and we, you know, look over at Europe and say, oh, they, they've got this figured out better than we do. And yet, whether it was looking at the experiences of people in the UK or Ghana, um, you know, I think it, it's the same barriers, the same challenges that we're also seeing here in the US in terms of identity systems that are being designed uh, in many cases, first and foremost for security without a ton of thought giving, being given to how it's actually going to impact people who might, for whatever reason, you know, be in a position where they're going to struggle to get through those systems. Um, and so, you know, I was reading this, you know, report that was very much not focused on an American perspective and basically seeing that, you know, I think these are, are universal problems across the globe. Um, I think the only benefit of that is it actually, you know, many cases when we get to discussions of identity, it becomes hard to have discussions across countries because it's such a local issue. But I think if there is a global theme here that's emerging that we're just starting to realize where a lot of systems are excluding people that also allows us to have, you know, broader global conversations around, I mean, really things like this code of conduct that women and identity has been working on, which is such a valuable contribution to, you know, being something that I think could be used across different countries uh, to, you know, architect systems that are more inclusive and that work for everybody. Absolutely. Um, agree on the on, on the depressing point, I guess, when I went through the, the, the UK piece and, and, and the Ghana piece, I think probably I was expecting there to be more differences than there actually were. So on the one hand, the commonality is useful because then it means, you know, we're solving for similar problems in different regions. But also, on the other hand, it's like, well, how much progress have we actually really made on a lot of these, a lot of these issues that are certainly not new. Um, so you mentioned, obviously, your, your area of focus is the US. So taking into account, you know, all that all that we've said and all that we're trying to do, how does so certainly the last five principles that we talked about, but the research as a whole, how do you see that fitting into the US market? And are there examples that you can share with us of, of, of what's being done in the US from an inclusion perspective? Yeah, well, I, I would say, you know, in almost every country, it's an issue that's not getting enough attention. Uh, although, you know, again, to what I said before, it's great seeing the work women and identities done here in the Better Identity Coalition. We've been trying to do some work to also shine a light on the challenges here and also you know, have been working directly on legislation that could actually uh, have the government provide some additional resources to help address the challenges. Um, you know, there, there was an article, we, when we talked last week, you know, talking about this, I mentioned there was an article in the Washington Post about five years ago uh, called The Invisibles, the cruel uh, catch-22 of being poor with no ID, which is actually referenced uh, in the report that you all had put out. Um, but for me, it was a bit of an uh, awakening in that I'm, I'm somebody who's been in this space a long time, but a lot of it's been focused around 
what are we doing to make things more secure or what can we do to enable online commerce? Um, you know, all good things and all important um, requirements to address. But the article really exposed what happens for those who these systems don't work for. And, you know, it really talked quite a bit about a group that's just up the road from me here in Washington, D.C., Founder United Methodist Church uh, over um, just on 16th Street uh, here in Washington that's established a group that they call the ID Ministry, uh, which is essentially a network of volunteers run out of their social justice ministry, which is a the one place in the city that people can come to uh, if for whatever reason they are sort of stuck in the identity process here in the city and need help. And, you know, what do I mean by stuck? You know, it could be somebody who was recently evicted and never had a driver's license and their birth certificate and their social security card were left in a cardboard box by the side of the road and, you know, it, were lost forever. And now they're, you know, trying to find new housing, they're trying to find a job and they don't literally have any documentation uh, of who they are. And it's not particularly easy to, to go get one. Uh, it can be somebody who's been in and out of homelessness, uh, you know, somebody who's, you know, just getting out of prison and looking to get restarted uh, in their life. Uh, somebody who, you know, maybe fled a domestic abuse situation. And again, they don't have any identifying documents because they were literally just, you know, running for their lives. So I, I talk about all this, I mean, not just from the article, which is worth reading, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, I did in the wake of it was actually reached out to Pastor Ben Roberts, who coordinates the ID ministry and has started volunteering there and, you know, also just trying to help them raise awareness of the issue. Um, I mean, I'll say at a personal level, on one hand, when you spend time there, it's inspiring to see what you're doing, what they're doing. On the other hand, I find it a little bit disgusting that in a city like Washington, D.C., it is falling to volunteers, you know, working out of the social justice ministry of a church to actually help people address what, from my perspective, ought to be an inherently governmental role. Um, but I think, you know, in too many cases, and this is, you know, not just in Washington, D.C., I think it's, you know, in most jurisdictions across the U.S. and across the globe, if you go into an agency that is in the identity business and you don't have the money to get the ID or you don't have the documents that you need uh, to prove who you are, the general take is, well, come back when you do. And there's no place else to actually go for help outside of, you know, volunteers and churches and charities across the country that are, are there to help people. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, in many cases, while, you know, these systems were designed, look, security is an important requirement, standards are an important requirement, but when these systems were never really designed with the idea of inclusion, with the idea of making sure they work for everybody, um, you know, that's an issue that really needs to get, you know, more attention now. And it's certainly one of the things we've been trying to do within, you know, the Better Identity Coalition. Absolutely. And I think one of the things we chose to focus on in this phase of the work was the financial services use case. And you've, met, you've mentioned before that, you know, there's the fact that it's falling to, you know, volunteers and, and social justice organizations, arguably, that's not necessarily who should be, be doing the work. Uh, we focus on financial services in particular. So do we think that there's more that when, when we think about the banks, for example, do we think that there's more that they could be doing? Are there examples of, you know, financial institutions who are getting this right potentially in the US or at least are moving towards trying to tackle the problem in some way? Yeah, it, it's an issue. I'll say they're, they're, they're trying to figure out how to best get their arms around right now. Um, I think, say, one of the best things, I haven't shared this publicly before, but one of the best things has actually come out of the Better Identity Coalition's work, you know, with the ID ministry has been that, so if you, our members are, we're probably about half, you know, large financial institutions. Uh, and then, you know, there's a bunch of other companies, you know, in there as well, including vendors and health firms and mobile network operators, tech firms. But we're largely driven by financial services requirements and that, you know, to your point, I think across the globe, um, you know, banking payments, fintech, this is, you know, where people run into identity um, and in many cases sort of run into a wall when they, they can't open an account if they don't have the documents they need. Um, and without, you know, publicly sharing the bank, I'll say senior executives from, you know, a top 10 financial institution we brought down last summer. They actually, you know, spent a Friday volunteering at the ministry, you know, talking to the leadership. And one of the things that they have done recently is launched a pilot in several of their branches uh, to do something that sounds really simple, but if they're able to help, I think is actually going to be somewhat transformational, which is, you know, today, if you go into a bank branch in the U.S. and you don't have any documentation, the answer is, well, come back when you do. We can't help you. They've changed that. In this new pilot, they're basically saying, what do you have and how can we help you? 
and you know, looking in some cases to see if they can, you know, I would say clone some of the work that you know the ID ministry does in their bank branches um, to you know actually try and help people among other things open a bank account. And you know, look, I, I you know don't want to say that all banks are only driven by sweetness and light here. You know, they're also you know, under tremendous political pressure because we have a huge problem with the unbanked and underbanked in this country. They're constantly under pressure to address this. But I will say talking to executives in financial services, they've pointed out that, you know, they believe probably about half the use cases when they have to turn somebody away for a bank account or some other sort of financial service, it's because the government essentially tells them they can't offer the service. You know, we've got requirements in the U.S. around the Bank Secrecy Act and the Patriot Act, whole customer identification program, that if you can't determine who somebody is, you cannot, you know, responsibly offer them a bank account. And so I think they're looking at this as a chance to, you know, both do good, but also, you know, do well in that ultimately they want to serve as many customers as possible. And this is an opportunity to, um, you know, help them do so. I think that's, that's really fascinating. It speaks back to, to one of the, the first point that I raised of putting the user at the, at the center of all of this, which I know can sound really simplistic, but just the notion of, someone going into a bank and saying, okay, what do you have and how can we help you rather than you don't have these things, you don't fit into the process, come back when, when you can. It's a simple sort of reframe of, of that problem, but it's saying, okay, well, what do you have and how can we help you rather than you don't have what we need, so we can't help you. I think that's just a really good sort of realization of that first point of putting the user at the center of these things, because ultimately we're trying to help the users to gain access. It's beneficial for the organization, it's beneficial for the individual. So figuring out how you can meet a consumer, an end user where they are is ultimately beneficial to them and it's also beneficial to the financial institution in this case. Okay, so let me flick onwards into the slides. So human impact, um, the, work, the work is out there, the report is out there, all the videos that we've produced are available on our YouTube and I will share the links with everybody so that they have access to those things. Uh, but in terms of the next steps, uh, we want to make sure that, you know, we keep the momentum going. There's, uh, there's a huge appetite for this. We're receiving lots of indications of support, lots of people wanting to be involved. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're, you know, taking advantage of all of that. So over the course of the remainder of, of uh, uh, calendar year 22 and then into uh, 2023, we want to uh, get started on the subsequent phases. So the economic impact of uh, ID exclusion will be sort of a complementary piece of work to the human impact work that we've been talking about so far today. It will look at you know, what it means from a financial perspective to be excluded as an individual, and what it means for organizations that are, you know, leaving all of those potential customers uh, out on the table because they can't currently serve them. So, you know, the old saying, what gets measured gets done. And, and you know, when we're talking about uh, financial institutions and any sort of uh, businesses, they are ultimately trying to sort of make a difference to their bottom line. And so the economics impact piece will, you know, speak the language that businesses understand, which is, you know, what are we leaving on the table from a financial perspective? So hopefully that piece of work will be really complementary to the human impact piece. So I, I see those things as kind of two sides of, of the same coin. Now the meat of what we will do for the remainder of, of this year and, and into next will be the code of conduct development itself and also the implementation framework. So what are those guiding principles that we need to set about that all digital identity providers can then adhere to? Um, driving again that high quality user experience for all of the different kind of users that will need to use digital identity systems. Um, and that piece of work will be uh, done in collaboration with a lot of different identity organizations from around the globe. We appreciate, and, and Jeremy, you mentioned it in, in one of your answers just before, that you know this is a global challenge that nobody has got complete, like no one's fixed it yet. Um, and I think it's going to take global stakeholders to really come up with a solution that works for as many different regions as possible. So a lot of the rest of this year will be spent on that code of conduct development and making sure that we're working in collaboration with as many different stakeholders as we can from as many different markets as we can so that the solution that we come up with is as broadly applicable as it could possibly be. But I don't think it's enough to just come up with some principles. I think the principles are really valuable, but unless we can 
find a way to ensure that organizations are actually adhering to the principles, not just signing up and then doing nothing on the back of that. I think we need, and the implementation framework, I think will be equally as important because that's the thing that will allow organizations to actually formally subscribe to these principles, but will also give us an opportunity to measure how organizations are doing against adhering to the principles. And I think that is the thing that's gonna drive actual change in the industry. So having the principles is great, but having a means of ensuring that organizations are abiding by those principles and are you know, willing to you know, certify themselves against those principles that's the thing that's actually going to create change in the organization in the industry so that's what we're pushing for over the rest of 22 and into 2023 so before i start to uh, um, cover off all of the various resources that are available jeremy i want to come back to you and uh, get your thoughts on kind of the the next steps because you know this is this is where it gets kind of difficult so you know doing the research is really valuable and we need to do that to understand where we are but then when it comes to creating the code of conduct, actually getting it implemented, kind of what are the next steps you think we need to be taking to drive as much utility as we can out of this work? Well, I, I think a lot of it's gonna come down to, you know, promotion and education. Um, and I think part of it is it, it's great to focus on the private sector, but a lot of this, you know, ultimately comes down in many countries to government itself. Uh, in that, you know, in pretty much every country, government is the one authoritative issuer of identity and while there's a whole bunch of industry solutions, a lot of them are still reliant on governments as the authoritative source. Um, and so I think trying to raise awareness of this from a policy perspective and also, um, you know, bluntly, you know, do it in a way that doesn't become politicized, uh, mm -hmm. because I think it's very easy for, for this to become politicized with certain issues uh, is going to be important. Um, you know, in the US, I, I mentioned before, you know, the work we've done in the coalition, um, you know, one of the things we've been excited about is there's now, you know, bipartisan legislation. It's uh, House Bill 4258, the Improving Digital Identity Act, which, you know, was introduced last year with bipartisan support. And one of the things it looks to do, you know, to be clear, much of where the coalition is focused is on how do we jumpstart new digital identity solutions backed by government that can close this gap between the physical documents that, you know, maybe worked 30 years ago and digital transactions where we're focused today. One of the you know, things we've been pushing for are grant dollars to the states here in the US to accelerate that transition to digital. But you know, when we worked with the bill's authors, um, one of the provisions that they put in there that we were really excited about and, and really you know, great, you know, glad to support was a provision that says, as we're giving you grant dollars to the states to accelerate the transition to digital, states need to reserve 10% of those dollars to provide services to assist individuals who can't get a traditional credential today, or maybe just need to you know, have their identity verified somehow so that they can go get a digital credential. Um, and you know, the idea there, I mean, look, it's two lines in a you know, five page bill, um, but let's make sure that as we're making investments in, in the digital side of identity, that we're not overlooking those who have already been left behind and also make sure that we're not exacerbating the gap between, you know, the haves and have nots in the digital world. Um, you know, that's a bill that, you know, as I mentioned, it, it's, you know, is the old schoolhouse rocks get used to go just a bill on Capitol Hill right now, you know, we're working to try and get it more attention. Um, you know, we actually hope to see a counterpart in the US Senate introduced uh, in the next few weeks, um, you know, talking about this issue with, you know, the White House and others in the Biden administration. It's a lot of work, and I will say it's not an issue that is getting a, a ton of attention right now. And I think it's going to take, you know, whether it's the work we're doing here in the U.S. or I think as the code of conduct and other ideas come out globally, uh, you know, time to take the, you know, uh, you know, have the ability to have direct engagement with policymakers to, you know, not just look at the code of conduct and nod their heads, but say we're actually going to make some changes in the systems that we deploy uh, to support the code of conduct. Absolutely. Okay. And. Um one final question for me before I check into the chat, chat pod to see if other people have asked questions. Say we fast forward to, I don't know, X number of years from now and the code of conduct is up and running and working. Um, what does success look like so in, in X number of years? And we've done all of this research and it's implemented, we have a trust mark, et cetera. What does true success look like for you for this phase of this overall research project? You know, I think at a high level, it means identity is not an issue we spend so much time thinking about anymore. 
because we've just gotten it done right. Um, you know, I, I did some work on the cybersecurity side of this back in 2016 when there was a bipartisan commission making recommendations on you know what the next presidency should do on a whole bunch of things around cybersecurity and the identity side. They set a really simple goal, which of course we failed to hit, which is, hey, identity is the number one vector of attack in cybersecurity every year by 2021. Let's say that that's not a problem anymore because we've made investments in identity and authentications infrastructure and gotten people to adopt them. And so the attackers aren't able to exploit it anymore. I'd love to set a goal you know, similar to say, look, by 2028, 2030, whether in the US or the UK or you know, across the globe, we don't have to talk about identity exclusion because governments have evolved the authoritative systems that they run so that they're not just focused on trying to put you through some sort of you know, bureaucratic um, hell to, you know, between time, you know, resources, you know, that you need to actually get through the system, but that there are different pathways so that if somebody comes in who, for whatever reason, can't clear, you know, the bureaucratic, the bureaucratic steps you have to get to, to get an ID, there's a path that you can be put on to go get help so that identity is truly inclusive and, you know, we can go solve other problems in the world, of which there will no doubt be a few that need our attention. Absolutely. I think that's, that's always the aim with this sort of work is that you want to get to the point where you don't need to do it anymore because it is just it's just the way that things are done and people are just included as a standard. Okay, so uh, before I go to uh, Q and A, um, just making everybody aware of the various different resources that are available. Um, we can share these slides and obviously share links to all of this information. So there's a number of blog posts on the dedicated uh, page on the Women in Identity website. We have a playlist which contains all of the human impact videos on our YouTube channel. And there is the full report which is available to download from our website as well. So again, I'll make sure that everybody has all of the links to all of this so you can um, peruse at your leisure all of the information that is out there. Um, and then the final uh, call to action. So, you know, we, we're really passionate about all of this. I think, you know, you all know that and you're, you're on this call for probably the very same reason. So we're encouraging everybody to, you know, continue this conversation, to share the resources that we've put out there, to engage in discussions on this topic as, as widely as possible. Um, the second point is around collaboration. So as I mentioned, as we start to develop the code of conduct piece of work itself, we want to make sure that we are collaborating with as many people in the industry, whether that's private sector, whether that's government organizations or nonprofits, we want to make sure that we're casting our net as wide as we possibly can so that we're taking in as many viewpoints as we possibly can. So again, if people are interested in collaboration opportunities, you can reach out to me directly or anyone at Women in Identity and we will funnel you to the right place. And then of course, sponsorship, this work doesn't just get magically done for free. Um, so we're always looking for further organizations to come on board uh, and support us through, from a sponsorship perspective. So if any of those or all three of those areas are of interest to anyone, please reach out to me or anyone in Women in Identity directly and we will you know, have a further conversation about that. So uh, last thing for me to say before we go to Q&A is thank you everybody for joining us, for, for listening in. I hope it's been really useful for everybody. Now this, like I said, is the first in a series of webinars all about the code of conduct. Um, we will come back and have a, hopefully a one-to-one -one session with Fuchsia so she can set, share her insights. She's got a really fascinating viewpoint. She was one of the participants in this phase of the research. I'm gutted she can't be with us today, but I'm hopeful that that just means we get to have another session where we get to talk about this and get her insights. Um, and then later in the year in November, we will have another sort of progress update in terms of where we've gotten to with the other work streams that I talked about, and we'll share any updates that we have come that point in the year. So now I will stop sharing my screen so everyone can see everyone more clearly, and I will go across to the uh, chat box to see. Um, I don't know if anyone else has been keeping an eye on the questions. Already had an offer of support uh, collaboration. Uh, so that's fantastic. I will definitely be following up with you on that point. Um, my apologies for not turning the closed captions back on after the video. I turned them off because they weren't doing very well on the video, which wasn't in English, unsurprisingly. Um, but then I forgot to turn them back on again. So my apologies for that. I don't know if we can add that in afterwards, but I will try my best. Um, and let me see, questions, aha, let me go to the Q&A. 
Um, so if someone's asked, do you think identity companies can make more money out of building inclusive identity products? Jeremy, I'll come to you on that one first and then maybe I can give a few. Yeah, of course, because then they can sell them to more people. So, I mean, I think it's a pretty straightforward answer. Um, Though, you know, look, in, in fairness, you know, to the, the question, I think not every company is always focused on that up front. You know, they're, they're focused on, you know, what is a specific use case that they can address. But um, no, I, I think across the globe, actually, I mean, when I look at the industry support for women and identity, when I look at what we're getting in the coalition, I think industry has woken up to this fact that, um, you know, I mean, there's a, a moral reason to do this, but this is also going to be good for business. And, you know, I mentioned before, you can both do good and do well. Um, and yes, if you can serve more people, you can make more money. Absolutely agree. I always find it interesting that a lot of times the, the explanation for not going after broader segments is that, you know, it's harder for organizations to serve those segments. It costs more money, et cetera. It might not be as straightforward serving every different customer segment, but at the end of the day, like you said, you know, the more people you can serve, the, the you know, the better you're doing as a business. And I don't always agree that, you know, serving uh, customers outside of the normal path is always going to be a lot harder or a lot more expensive. I think there is good, good business sense behind doing it. And I think more organizations are actually starting to see that, which is, which is really, really good. Um, Another question, which governments are doing inclusion in identity well? Do you have a view on that, Jeremy? Not a good one, because I'm trying to think of a good example and I, I don't know that I have one I can point to. Yeah, I think I've, I've, I've come across this question before and I think lots of, lots of different governments are making more strides and definitely more recently, we're seeing a lot more efforts being put into that. I don't know necessarily that anyone has done it well before. So I don't think there's any, you know, shining star that we can point to of, yes, those guys have got it. Therefore, we're just going to copy what they've done. Um, I think lots of people, certainly at the moment, are making a lot greater strides towards more inclusion. It's becoming more of a topic on the agenda of almost every sort of like government body that I come across and that I speak to. So I think there's definitely going to be people to point to in the future, hopefully the near future. But I don't know if I could point to anyone right now and say, absolutely, they're doing it really well. Uh, another question in here from Sudan. Uh, all the ID networks and data sources at least need a document to identify a person. How do people not under this global network of identity be secured with their first legitimate identity? So I suppose the challenge there is everyone needs something as a starting point. And historically those starting points have been your passport, your birth certificate, et cetera. Um, so how do we shift that paradigm, I suppose? Uh, and ensure that everybody has some kind of breeder document, as we call it, um, in order to move further along the process. Any thoughts on that? I mean, it, it's hard, I think, in part because, I mean, certainly in the US, you know, we don't have, um, how would I say it? We do not have a single national ID, but we have a patchwork of systems that are issued between the federal, state, and local level uh, that, you know, collectively make up our, our you know, national identity infrastructure. So, you know, I was born in a county in Michigan, my birth certificates from there, that was all I had until I turned 16. And then the state government gave me a driver's license. Uh, the federal government issued me a social security number, which is an identifier, but not necessarily a credential. And I have a passport, which I think only about 40% of Americans ever get. A lot of us never really leave here, um, or should, but that's another story for another time. Um, and so, you know, if you don't have anything, where do you start? I mean, going back to the story of the ID ministry up the street, if you walk in with nothing and don't have any money and don't know where to go, it's, you know, a whole bunch of things that you can do to sort of build one on the other to get up to something that's a higher assurance credential, like a driver's license. I mean, it starts with giving them money for the bus to go up 16th street to a free clinic, where if a physician will examine you for 15 minutes and sign that report, you can then take a doctor's physical to the social security administration that the federal government runs and use that to get a replacement copy of your social security card. Though it has to be mailed to an address, can't be a post office box. You can then take that card and the, the uh, physical and go to the vital records bureau in the city to get a copy of your birth certificate. Well, that also costs another 20 bucks. And then if you have all that, maybe you can start to think about a driver's license, but it really is 
you know, all of our different systems all point to the other in terms of trying to figure out who's who. And so it's actually really hard if you don't have anything to sort of, you know, restart that whole identity life cycle again. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the big barriers, certainly through the interviews that we did was around, you know, not having the money to get access to various documentation. And, you know, that is a big challenge for people for any number of reasons as to why they've ended up there. So, you know, the question is, these things all have a cost. Is there a way to introduce something that is low or no cost so that it's like a, a starter document for people to, you know, find their way up the ladder to the higher assurance credentials that you mentioned, like your driver's license or your passport. But immediately when something has a cost attached to it, there is going to be a certain set of people that cannot attain that document because of the price tag that's attached to it. So it's a case of, is there something that we can do or is there something that governments can introduce that doesn't have a cost attached to it that gets you on that ladder to be able to build up to the, you know, the holy grail, which is the, the passports and the driver's licenses. Okay, um, I think that is all of the questions that I've seen. If anyone has anything else or is posted in the chat, I'm currently looking in the Q&A box. Um, I think that is everything for now. So if anyone does have any further questions, you know, you can always reach out to uh, us at Women in Identity. You can easily find us on, on in, uh, not Instagram. You can find us on Instagram, but maybe send the questions via Twitter because it's more, more amenable to that. Um, contact us via email, you know, go on the contact forms on our websites, etc. You can find Jeremy on Twitter too. He's very, very prevalent over there. <laughs> I'm often tweeting in various things. Um, but thank you everybody for joining. Really appreciate that. Really appreciate all of the questions as well. And if anyone wants to follow up with me directly, then you are always more than welcome to do so. But thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. And I hope you will join us for the next uh, Code of Conduct webinar session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye all.